Calvary Chapel since the inception has been a work of the Holy Spirit, and it continues to be that way. God call, calls common people like us and like myself to have a vision for something that we've never seen before. He calls us to a city, and he called me to Greensburg 21 years ago to, to plant a church. I had no idea what I was doing. Cindy didn't either, but we had a big heart because we knew that God wanted to reach this city. And so we started in the YWCA and it turned into be a wonderful place where we've met many, many people who are still with us to this day in this ministry. And God provided that place for us all those years ago to start this church called Calvary Chapel, Westmoreland County. We were there for 12 years. We set up and took down, set up and took down. It was weary, made you weary. But we kept doing what God called us to do. Some people came and loved it. Some people came and visited and it wasn't for them. Some people came for a while and left. And some people came for a while, left and came back again. It's just been an interesting journey watching how the Holy Spirit has worked in people's lives. And so then God provided, after many years in praying, a place on the corner of Chestnut and Brandon. It was the former Holy Trinity Lutheran Church. And we were so excited to have a place we didn't have to set up and take down anymore. It was wonderful. Uh, beautiful uh, character church, stained glass windows. I mean, we, we, we were home, man. You know, we had what we thought was going to be where we were going to be until the Lord either came or took us home. And then the church began to grow, and we weren't anticipating that. Uh, we were grateful for what God had provided as far as a body that we could minister to, but we had no idea that he had a bigger vision than what we had at the time. So as the families began to come and the kids began to be born, and we began to run out of space quite quickly, and then I began to see the older folks, which... A lot of us are starting to become now having trouble getting up the steps and uh, dangerous uh, big, big steps in the inside and outside. Uh, and parking issues where neighbors, as Debbie said, were getting upset and cursing at some of the new people that were pulling into their parking space on a Sunday morning. Not a fun thing to do when you're visiting a new church for the first time and you're excited and someone told you it's a good place to come and people are giving you F-bombs or something because you're parking in front of their, front, front of their house. You know? So, But some of you weathered that storm and some, I think, this said, you know, we like the church, but we don't like the neighborhoods. We're not coming back. But uh, anyway, we're there and, and then God begins to stir us about another place. Where do we go? What do we do? And uh, inevitably, it ends up being the uh, Greensburg Shopping Center. And so the landlord gave us favor and a reasonable lease. And uh, with the help of uh, many of you in the church, financially, prayerfully, gifted-wise, designed uh, a space for us to have a church. And lo and behold, after many months of waiting, uh, we're going to be there next Sunday. How about that? The code people came by last week, and there's a few things we have to take care of on Monday and Tuesday, but they're minor things we have to do, nothing major, and uh, they'll be done, and we'll get the approval. Uh, chairs came on Thursday night, and uh, praise God, 20, 25 people showed up to unload them, and within a half an hour, we had them all over the place. And we're still sort of trying to get them organized, but uh, you guys are going to love the ch chairs. I mean, you'll probably... A lot of you probably fall asleep, so I have to yell once in a while to wake you up. They're really comfortable. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, uh, as, as Walt said, next Saturday, sort of like a private open house for people who are part of this church. You can show up if you don't want to really spend time to pray uh, for the chairs as Matt leads us. Feel free to walk around, get familiar with the space. Uh, the first Sunday, we're going to have everybody together. No kids ministries, all kids, parents, family, just big family gathering. Uh, next Sunday, and we're going to have a, a short message and then an open mic time. We'll just pass around, and if anybody feels like sharing something of the history of the ministry and what it's done in your life, 
um, what you believe God's leading you to do, uh, share the excitement. It's just like a big family gathering, and I thought it's appropriate leading up to Thanksgiving, too, because it'll be a, a Sunday of true Thanksgiving for the great things God hath wrought. So I'm very, very grateful for uh, the privilege to pastor you guys for a period of time. I trust for more years to come. That's up to God. Uh, but we are planning on succession, not tomorrow, not next year, maybe not five years, but we want this church to be a healthy church for many years to come in every ministry, uh, whether it's worship or um, pastors or elders or Sunday school workers or uh, sound people, and we need more help. Uh, we're going to need more help in teaching the kids. We're going to have more classrooms to be able to do more creative stuff. And so if God's you're here and you're thinking, what is God's will for me? Uh, we could sure use more help in the kids' ministry and, um, and a lot of other ministries, you know. Uh, I have a friend of mine coming down from Alaska. He'll be arriving here next Sunday or Saturday, I'm not sure, next weekend. And him and his wife are praying about testing the weathers, whether they should move back here. He's 43. I've known him for many years, and uh, he's an elder in Shelter Bible Church in, in uh, Alaska. And uh, they don't know what God's will is yet, but I, I challenge them that perhaps maybe God's calling them down here to help me. And he's a great guy. Many of you know Chad Personette, and uh, he's, he's been in and out of the church over Christmas and holidays for years. They have five children. They have a little baby who has a lot of health issues. They're gonna, he's going to get... Um, uh, some surgery with his eyes when they come down at Children's and some other issues that uh, Talon's struggling with. And uh, so it's sort of a good reason for them to come back here anyway because Children's Hospital is like the best in the country, you know, when you've got little babies having trouble. So pray for Chad and Colleen as they come down, a wonderful couple. And um, if it's not God's will for them now, then then uh, we'll see maybe it's God's will later or maybe God will raise some other uh, young guy that will come here or is already here that I don't even know about that I can begin to train and develop because we want this church to be a strong, healthy Bible church for many years to come, right? If the Lord tarries for another hundred years, we want this to be a strong church for the next hundred years. That's the vision. And so, uh, so anyway, Joshua... Uh, every Calvary starts out with a prayer and a need. And so a guy and his wife, they'll go, a family, to a town, and they'll just trust God to start a, a, a Bible church, a, a church. And sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. There's all kinds of reasons why it works and sometimes why it doesn't work. But um, it has to start with a vision, and, and, and God calls someone to be a leader for a period of time. And usually what happens when you do something like this, you're mentored by someone who helps you and prays for you and is there to encourage you and counsel you when you go through rough times, which you do in ministry. So Joe Foch and Jerry Paradise and Calvary Philly, very dear friends, close uh, mentors to me, uh, are just a phone call away or a visit. And so I don't do anything in this ministry in regard to leading it apart from godly counsel, whether it's here from my elders and the pastors I serve with, or getting insight from them who have done this uh, for over 30 years now. Calvary Philly is a church of about 10,000, and they've planted 25 churches out of that, so God has had his hand on that ministry, and I'm honored to be a church plant out of Calvary Chapel, Philly, so I'm accountable to Joe and Jerry as a pastor. So... In the midst of ministry, though, there's always a handing off of the ministry. And Moses uh, is passing away in verse one of, uh, chapter 1 of Joshua. He's passed. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. So whenever the leader dies or the leader passes on or the leader uh, you know, I don't believe retirement's in ministry, but there's a change, a transition of whatever. God uh, never gets worried. Oh my gosh, what are we going to do now? Moses is dead. How's this thing going to continue? God always has someone in the wings waiting to continue his work. None of us are indispensable. And so uh, God's beginning now to obviously clarify that uh, there's a challenge for 
Joshua now, and he tells them immediately, uh, Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I'm giving to them, the children of Israel. Joshua and Caleb were the only two of the twelve spies that were sent by Moses that went in and saw the vision that God had through Moses and said, Moses, we can do this. There are intimidating people and forces there we have to fight against. The walls are real big. There's actually giants there. The other ten guys are freaking out. There's no way we're going to do this. We can't beat them. Caleb said we can do this. And Joshua also knew that they could do it. But because of their disobedience and fear and all that, they went into chaos for a long time to get to where God had wanted to get them much sooner. Well, now uh, Joshua is going to have the privilege to go into the promised land, Canaan, which Moses was initially going to go into, but because of some of the things he had done in his ministry, the Lord told him he wasn't going to enter in. So the Lord took him home. And so now here's Joshua taking over this huge responsibility of taking this multitude of the children of Israel uh, from where Moses left off now into the promised land. He says, every place, every place, not this one little step, but every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you. Uh, boy, when God says that, He means it. And boy, what confidence you can have when God says that and leads you that way. He says, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon and as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. Canaan represents a place of rest. It's not heaven, but it is an awesome place of land flowing with milk and honey. It was a promised land that God had given to Israel. Uh, to this day, it is the promised land for the nation of Israel. They're living in it and dwelling in it and prospering it and enjoying it. And uh, one day the Lord Jesus will return and establish His throne in the city of Jerusalem. And the whole world will worship Him as the King of kings and Lord of lords. What was Joshua thinking though when God's speaking to him about all this? He's confirming His promises. And now he's going to tell them in verse 5, and as Joshua's thinking about this, and as I think about the challenge of a church that's growing and, and the responsibility and the gravity and, and, and people getting upset with me at times and people doubting whether I'm hearing from God or not or we're hearing from God or not, it's a scary place to be. I can't tell you how many times I walked into that building down there and said, Lord, what have I gotten these poor people involved in? I mean, I could not visualize what it would become and what you see next Sunday will blow your minds. I go in and I, I weep to myself, Lord, great things you have done. And you're giving and you're tithing and you're prospering the church with your financial offering has made it possible and feasible. What we thought was going to cost us 200000 will end up costing 350000 But God kept providing the offerings through you guys. I have no idea who gives what or who does what, but I would look at the totals every Tuesday morning at the bank, and I'd say, I'm saying, I'm freaking out, Lord, how's this going to work? You know, we're not going to take any debt on. We don't want to borrow money. We don't want to hassle your people about money, 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 money. But you have given and continually give willingly to what it is you're going to see there next week. And so Joshua's probably thinking, okay, I get it, Lord. You're telling me you're going to be with me. You're going to guide me. You're going to direct me. But what about this group of enemies that are going to be there? And how am I going to deal with that? And he's already anticipating the thought process of, of Joshua because in verse 5 it says, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. In other words, I am the leader. You're my assistant, Joshua. And he says to pastors all across the world, when he calls them to do something that's humanly impossible with human ingenuity and human wisdom and human might, God goes before those people he calls in any kind of ministry. He went before Mary Ann before she was called before to go to the nursing home. God had this all set up. He says, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. 
Now, if you remember God's word to Moses in Numbers 13, Moses is scared about what it is he's called to do. And Moses kept saying to the Lord, as I do, and I'm sure you do, Lord, if you don't go with us, I'm not going. If you're not going to prove yourself strong on our behalf and give us evidence that you're tracking before us and we're following you, we're not going to take one step forward. But there comes a time when God compels a man and a movement like he did with the children of Israel and Joshua that you have to go forward. You can't run away. You can't go backwards. You have to go forward by faith. You have to walk by faith, not by sight. So the vision was already there, but was it going to turn out in a good way or a bad way? Were they going to be victorious or were they going to fail? And all of us always understand the the dynamics of, of, of faith and the struggle we have at times to have faith, to believe, and to trust God. Perhaps some of you are here today and as Mary Ann challenged you, you're sitting here and God's made it very clear about something He's calling you to do, whether it's in this church or outside the body. And you're struggling with what it is that God's laid on your heart. Be encouraged. Because if God's put it there in your heart, He'll see it through. He'll make it come to pass. He says, as I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Isn't that awesome? God will never leave you or forsake you. Your vision to have a godly family. To have a good marriage to have a good career, to be able to have an impact on the community in your life. God is there with you. Jesus promised us He will never leave us or forsake us. Never. If God be for us, who can be against us? He says in verse 6, be strong and of a good courage. We need to be told that, right? Be strong and of a good courage. All of us need to hear that. I'm so thankful for many of you who I know who have been praying for me to be strong and of a good courage. Don't look at their faces and don't fear the face of man. Just keep going and doing what you got to do. For to this people you shall divide an inheritance, the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. So he's giving them specific direction of how the land is even going to be divided. I think of all the ministries. Like, we don't have this all figured out yet. When we go into the space, we all have to be flexible, right? Uh, Things are going to change. There'll be transition. There'll be new ideas. There'll be new leaders lifted up. There'll be new people called that'll come in that, that the Lord's going to send to us to help us understand the big picture. I don't have the big picture yet completely. And i got to get out of the way and continually get out of the way so God can manifest what it is He wants. Not what I think is prudent. That's not important. What does God want to do with what He's giving to us? And so, God has to tell Joshua to be strong and very courageous. Why? Because at times we're weak. We're fearful. And we're not courageous. God has to impart that strength for you in your academic endeavors or your new job descriptions or your future families that are growing and all the people that come in and the insanity that can incur in in this life itself with people. To be strong and be very courageous. And he says, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. In other words, do everything that God tells you to do. You're in the Lord's army, right? You're doing what it is God's called you to do. Not to be popular, not to please man, but you're doing what it is that God's called you to do. Don't turn from it. To the right hand or to the left. Don't second guess what it is God's directed you to do, Joshua. Keep heading straight. Keep going forward. And he had his share of people that didn't like what he was doing. They were second-guessing him. And if you study the book, you'll see some of the stuff that he had to deal with. God tried to get Moses to go with the program completely. And Moses vacillated a little bit. 
Moses wasn't the guy that was going to get them to the next level, right? He did a superb job for a period of time of what God, him, God called him to do. But then Moses had to be set aside for Joshua, and Joshua wasn't a kid anymore. He was uh, somewhere between 68 and 78 years old when he took this uh, gauntlet and, and moved uh, the nation of Israel into the promised land. So he's, he's getting, him, getting his head down. Get it, get it together, Joshua. I know you're, you're, you're like overwhelmed, but this is what I'm telling you to do. This goes straight. Don't go to the left. Don't go to the right. Don't listen to this voice. Don't listen to this murmuring. Don't listen to this complaining. Don't get uptight with this backbiting. Just keep doing what it is you've got to do. And he says that you may prosper wherever you go. And it was obvious what had happened as a result of his obedience as you read this whole book of Joshua. The game plan, the playbook as I refer to, is this book. He says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may do according to all that is written therein. For then you shall make your way prosperous and then you shall have good success. Adversity will come. Challenges will come. Setbacks will come. Don't worry about everything being smooth because it's never smooth. There's always challenges. There's always obstacles to overcome when God calls you to do something. But if you stay in the Word of God and you let the Word of God wash over your mind and calm your heart down and you're going to be obedient to just what God's telling you to do, what He's showing you to do, He's going to prosper what it is He's called you to do. And it's just not a casual thing. I mean, Joshua was in the Word daily. It, it saturated his whole being. Mind. Every, everything he was up against. And we need to learn from what God said to Joshua in regard to our own lives, our own families, and the ministries that God has called us to as a church, Calvary Chapel. That you do what it is that God says to do in His Word. He says, have I not commanded you? And he needs to hear it again. He's already told him this. He's going to tell him again. Have I not commanded you? Question mark. Be strong and of a good courage. Be, do not be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That's like one of my life verses. Because I can get dismayed. I can get discouraged. I can get overwhelmed. I can fall into despair and hopelessness just like any one of you guys can and do. And when this verse comes to my mind, and I apply it to my own life, I'm assured that the Lord is with me wherever I go. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the camp and command the people, saying, Now, there has to be a team. And whoever's on the team has to have the confidence that the leader of the team is hearing from God, and they're going to cooperate with him. They're going to go in the direction that he's telling them to go. They're going to delegate and they're going to, together as a team, do what it is that God's telling Joshua to do here. Now can you imagine Joshua's commanding the officers, these are the leaders of the people, saying this is what you guys got to tell everybody. And I tell Walt and I tell Lewis, I ask the elders and Rick, the worship leader, and the teachers and the Sunday school people, this is what God is leading us to do. And sometimes someone will get mad at me and they don't want to do what it is I'm saying that the Lord wants us to do. And I don't have time for arguing. I'm 60, going to be 67. I don't know how much time I got left, but I want to make sure this is strong and healthy and secure and solid to go the long haul down the road. And it doesn't matter who's in this position, there is always uh, the, the, the Monday morning quarterback, right? <laughs> he should have done it this way. Why did he do it that way? Well, human beings make mistakes. They do. And not everything that a leader says to do is always going to be the perfect solution. That's why we have uh, what we call um, 
plurality of leadership. Any big initiative is vented and holes poked through by other people who serve in the church and leadership. And when we have that assurance, yeah, this is the Lord, this is what we're going to do, then we don't vacillate, we make the decision and go. So he has the, all these, all these uh, thousands upon thousands upon thousands and thousands of people. Joshua can't do this by himself. He tells these officers, pass through the camp and command the people. This is not open for negotiation. <laughs> this is what we're doing and we're moving. And if you guys aren't going to move, you're going to be left behind. You're going to die like all the other ones that died in the wilderness that weren't able to enter into the promised land. Prepare provisions for yourselves Get ready, we're moving. Well, I don't think I, it's too, you know, we can't get no, none of that stuff going on. Within three days, you will cross over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. My prayer is that as a church, we got like what the, the six days coming up of, of a heads up. <laughs> you know, come and go and do what it is that the Lord's calling you to do with enthusiasm. One heart, one mind, excitement, joy, anticipation. And it's such a blessing for me to hear people say, I'm so excited about what we're going to do. I'm so looking forward to this. I see people come to the building the first time and they, they walk through and they're like in awe. They're like, wow, I can't believe what God's done here and what we're going to be able to use and how we're going to be able to reach people with the Lord's Word. It's, it's a privilege. And, and I really believe this, this Sunday coming up is going to be this outstanding because we're all going to be so broken and humbled down by what God has given to us for such a time as this. And so he's uh, telling the Reubenites, the Gadites, the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua spoke saying, remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, the Lord your God is giving you rest and He's giving you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side of the Jordan. So these three tribes are going to be on the eastern side, right by Canaan there. And this is what God gave them. And it's okay. Uh, they're going to be there. But you shall pass before your brethren armed all your mighty men of valor and help them. So in other words, you had these three tribes here. Everybody else is going over. But these tr three tribes weren't saying, well, we're not going to help. No, they were all the same heart, the same mind. And they were going to go in and do what it is that the Lord God commanded them to do. The Lord your God is giving you rest and is giving you this land. And now all your family is going to be involved in all this. And Moses is going to, uh, as Moses gave you this side of the Jordan, now you're going to pass before your brethren armed, all your mighty men of valor, and help them until the Lord has given your brethren rest. Uh, boy, I'm so thankful you guys are helping. People are asking me, what do we got to take? What do we got to move? Thank God everything's pretty much in the building. You just have to show up with your children and your checkbook, okay? <laughs> That's all you got to do. The checkbooks are really light, right? But anyway, uh, so he's, he's giving them a direction here and the importance of, of rest. Uh, Cindy says, I can't wait till this project's done and I'll finally get my husband back again. In the last two weeks, I'm there continually sweeping, doing this, doing that, whatever I can do. You're asking a guy, are you sure about this? No, this is better. You make it this way, change it this way, make it, you know. Uh, we got to make these uh, adjustments, last minute ideas or visions coming together. And I'm waking up at three in the morning and I'm texting the contractor or someone else about, hey, what about this? What about that? Br rest. I'm looking forward to it. As he gave you, and they also have taken possession of the land which the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and enjoy it. And I can't wait till you guys go to Calvary Chapel, Westmore, and the Greensburg Shopping Center and enjoy it. It's your place. God's giving it to you for your ministries and what God's going to do. And I can't wait till people start coming to us and say, hey, what about this? Can we do this? Can we start this? Can we do and God's going to give you the ability to do that. And if it's of Him, it'll work and it'll grow and it'll increase whatever God might be putting on your heart to do. Enjoy it. Which Moses, the Lord's servant, gave you on this side of the Jordan toward the sunrise. So they answered Joshua saying, oh, this is the pastor's dream. The leader's dream. 
All that you command us, we will do. <laughs> is, is that reality? Is that really happen in life? <laughs> if, if I ever, you know, it, it's interesting. Whenever we talk about division, many times people say, well, that's not my vision. <laughs> that's not our vision. I'm thinking, how can you be in a church community where God has entrusted pastors and leaders to guide the church and, and all of a sudden you say, this isn't my vision. It's like, it, it doesn't make sense, you know? I don't know what you think about Donald Trump one way or the other. That's immaterial. But one thing is, if, if you don't have the same vision Trump has, guess what? You're fired! <laughs> and it's, uh, people are not fair. He's an idiot. He's an egomaniac. The guy, God bless him, he's just trying to, to do an impossible job. And you need to pray for him, just like we prayed for Barack Obama. Or we prayed for the, every guy that has that job. You know, 30, 40% like him, 60% hate him. It's just the way pastors, I have no what the, idea what the statistics are, but it's probably somewhat similar to that. <laughs> All that you have commanded us, we will do. Not for, not for me, but for the Lord and His people. Because whenever you agree, and you, as long as it isn't sinful, you might have a different idea. Well, I think the carpet should be black instead of gray. Well, that's uh, up to suggestion. It's already in, though. It is gray. So <laughs> you, you can't change it now, you know? But hey, we, we, we got kids' ministry. We got these kids, you know? They're not going to be feasible for having 60 kids in one room trying to do something when we're doing worship next door you know, with noise and that kind of stuff. We have more room. There's going to be age-appropriate classrooms. That's why we're going to need more teachers. So you can disciple a three- and a four-year-old completely different than you're discipling a nine- to a 12-year-old. You know, this is the way it is. And we need people to have the vision to help with that and to move that way. And, and there'll be other changes, you know. I have no idea what, what God will do. I'm trying to figure out how we're going to do baptisms in there. I'm trying to figure out how we can get a hose outside the building in the spring and put a portable tub out there. You had a big parking lot and we do the baptisms outside in the parking lot. All that you've commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. My prayer is for unified people. I don't handle the worship. Rick handles the worship. I give him input. If I think something should be a little different or whatever, Rick flows with it. To, so does Lucas. But I don't have to worry about what those guys do. They're very gifted and talented. I stay away from that. And I pray for them. And I'm thankful for their, their gifting and their anointing. But if someone comes to me about worship, hey, I don't you go, go to Rick or Lucas because I'm not going to... Uh, that's their responsibility, Right? Or the sound guys, and that Mr. Venucci is responsible. You don't mess with the Italian Venucci. <laughs> he said, "This is the way it is. This is the way it is." You know, that's right, man. <laughs> Not me. I stay out of that sound booth because he has a special area. If I touch something, the electricity electricity will come on. Hey, Clark, this is in your space here. I get it, Dave. I'm out of here. Just as we heeded Moses, and all things so we will heed you. Only the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. You know, we'll follow you. We'll serve with you. We'll love you and we'll pray with you as long as we know the Lord is with you. As soon as there's evidence in this church, if the Lord is not with us, I'm going to be the first one to get out of here. I would hope you guys would all run too. But God is with us now. He's favored us. He's blessed us. He's provided for us. And He's gifted us with all you wonderful people. The danger of rebellion, the Bible says rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. 
Whoever rebels against your command, in verse 18, and does not heed your words, and all that you command him shall be put to death. Isn't that crazy? Now, we don't do that stuff now, but thank God, you know. But this was God's call back, and this was a big transition of a ton of lives that were going to be affected by obedience or disobedience. So, this is a serious deal here. And the leadership are on the same board. Whoever's rebelling against the command doesn't listen to Joshua's direction. They're not messing around, right? You're dead. You're done. Now, I have no idea how many people were put to death. I, I, it doesn't give us any. Maybe no one was. Maybe everybody's like, hey, we're just going to do what we know we need to do. Again, only be strong and of a good courage. So you have this responsibility you do as much as I do of, of moving to this new space. And, and I said, I think it was a month ago, and I made sure I took the week off after that so you guys wouldn't want to beat me up after church. But I said it very nicely, and I, I trust humbly that if you're here and you don't like this place, don't waste your time here. Find a place you can be happy and worship God and be moving in the direction with wherever they're going. Don't be here if you distrust me as a pastor or the other pastors of the leadership, right? It, it doesn't make sense. There was times I left churches for, you know, there's reasons you leave a church. Sexual immorality, financial propriety, and heresy. R.C. Sproul said that's the three stools, three-legged stools the church stands stable on. Right now, as far as I know, because Walt hands, handles the finances and I have complete trust in him, and Susan who writes the checks to pay the bills, there's no financial impropriety here. I don't write any checks. So I'm under the authority of the treasurer in regard to how the funds are dispersed and used here. Sexual morality. As far as I know, I know in my own life for sure, and I know these guys I serve with, I don't sense there's anything sexually immoral occurring right now in this church. Maybe in the congregation there is. I don't know. But I can't read hearts. But as far as your leadership is concerned in this church, there is no sexual immorality occurring. And if there was, it would be dealt with rapidly. And there is no heresy. We're not teaching unbiblical things here. We're going line upon line, precept upon. And you can follow along. We went right through the book of Joshua this morning. So it's really critical when we go from this beautiful campus into the city of Greensburg, that we go with the same heart and the same mind, right? That we're not going to go to the left or the right. We're, we're, we're trusting that the Lord is leading us to impact eventually a lot of people we've never met before. In order for it to be a seamless transition, we have to allow the Lord to calm us down if we're uptight about anything and to sort things out that we might be fragmented with or emotion or pain or unforgiveness or bitterness, we have to allow the Lord to wash it out of our lives because we don't want to take garbage with us, right, to the next place. What's really cool, we had this big storage room down there, and we're, we're winding up. Sorry for going a little bit longer, but we'll be out of here in a couple minutes. We had this big room, and I walked in there with Walt. I said, what is it? I can't believe we had... You, you know, when you were together for a long time as a couple, you have all this junk, and you look at it, you say, how do we get all this stuff? Where did it come from? I'm walking in there. I, I, I was like in shock. I, I said, he said, well, why don't we just get rid of it all? I said, yeah, I think that's a good idea. But I said, we've got to get some of these ladies in here to know a little bit more about this stuff than we do. So uh, Jess and Deb and a couple other uh, different people went down there, looked around, Janet, and, and they went through it. Ruby, Krista, and they, and they okay, this is good. This, we can move. So they got like a little pile. It's not... It's not like real big, but a certain pile they're going to bring with them because it's stuff we can use, right? But everything else is going to the vets or to Goodwill or whatever. We're not taking any trash into that building, right? Physically. 
But I don't want to take any emotional, spiritual trash in there. I want my heart, and I've been praying about my own life as well as I trust you're praying about yours. Lord, I need to have your assurance that I'm the guy still to do this in the days ahead. I don't want to be at odds with anybody. I don't want to have any kind of angst in my heart about anything. I want to go with open hands, right? And we all should go with open hands. Lord, this is your work. What is it that you want to do with this place now? What is it you want to do with us and me and all of us together? And that you would pour out your love upon us, Lord, so that we can love you and love one another in ways we've never even experienced before. And that we leave behind here today what God doesn't want us to take, right, to the next journey we're on. It's interesting, Dave, when Janine designed the stage, right? I looked, I said, why is that stage so big, right? It's huge. When you see it, you're going to be like... And all of a sudden, she had this vision of this maple wood as an altar, basically, all around that stage. So we're down there. We pray as pastors every Friday morning. We get there at 6, pray to 7. So it was the first time we were able to pray in the sanctuary. And I'm sitting in these comfy chairs, you know, and the Lord just says, Walt began to pray. I just got to get on my face before God. And I got up there on my knees at the altar, and it was perfect size to get on my knees to pray. And I prayed, and all of a sudden the Lord said, Clark, that's why that stage was built that way. Because someday there's going to be 100 people at that altar on their face before the Lord asking God to work in their lives or to save someone they love or, or to repent and turn from a sin that's destroying their lives. So I ask you to be in prayer this next week. Talk with your families, your spouses. Uh, be, uh, ask God to give you a vision for what it is He's calling you for. Uh, dump the trash. I'm having a prayer here, so we dump trash this morning in our hearts. And we go with a it's, a, it's a brand new brush and a brand new piece of um, artwork that God's going to begin to paint and change and do, right? It's going to be a beautiful creation that God's going to do. So thank you for your support, your prayers, your love, your patience, your mercy, your forgiveness of me as pastor. Um, I'm very, very humbled by all this and overwhelmed at the same time. But as I said to Chuck years ago when I saw him at a pastor's conference, it was, I think, 15 years into ministry, 16. He's dying. Last time we're going to see him. And we all wanted to thank him and hug him and let him know how grateful we were for what it was that God did in his life that we're all part of. If it wasn't for Pastor Chuck, I would have never been a pastor. But he was a guy that said God uses weak and foolish vessels. And he gave us a shot. We're in seminaries. Most of them wouldn't. Give us a history of your life. Well, I was a hippie, and I slept around, and I drank, and I drugged, and I did this. And Well, you're, you're not qualified. <laughs> oh, okay, I guess I can't. Maybe I can collect the offering or whatever. Sweep, I'll sweep. I like to sweep. When you get done, you say, wow, something really happened here. <laughs> Something's clean, right? Well, I went up to Chuck and I said, Chuck, I said, you know, after all these years and pain and struggle and failing and suffering and dying to self, it continually needs to happen. God's doing a work, and we we're going to get a radio station at that time. And I was telling him, I said, thank you for letting us hook our wagon to your engine. And Chuck never took credit for anything. He, many of you never met him and, and knew him, but 
he just had this marvelous smile about him. And he just had this big smile. He says, great things God hath wrought. And it's really true. Every one of your lives represent the great things God has wrought. And it's just a privilege to be able to see your faces and know you and see what God's doing in your lives and how he's changing your lives. So uh, keep on keeping on. Amen.